So uh, I'm going to start with um, Tonia. Trust can be considered so nebulous um, and so elusive. And I think perhaps if you asked all of us in this room, what does trust mean to us? You probably would get 105 different answers. So when you talk about trust, how do you define it in the context of your work? Um, and how do people, how do organizations and the employees define it? Um, well, that's a big question. Uh, the research we've done in the last year shows that you can unpack trust into four dimensions, right? Uh, ability, right? Are you competent? Will you actually be able to do what you say you're going to do? Right? Do you have what it takes, the skills and the tools? Um, ability, integrity, right? Are you honest? Do you tell the truth? When you, when you make a promise, you know, are you exaggerating your claims? Mm -hmm. um, dependability, do you keep your promise? Mm -hmm. right? And then the fourth one is a P word, purpose. Mm -hmm. right? what's, the bigger, what's the big picture? Right? What, what are your motives about? What are you here to do? Right? So those are the four dimensions that inform, we found uh, specifically we were studying trust in corporations. Mm -hmm. um, but as I've thought about it and we've started looking at other data and you know, we're about to release a big report where we looked at trust in brands. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and the model holds up, right? What are you promising? Are you gonna deliver? Are you gonna do it well? Mm -hmm. right? Are you being truthful about what you're claiming? Um, so that's kind of a, a simplification of, of what it is, you know? But I think a lot of what Doug was talking about in terms of behavior and action, it's trust is not talk, mm -hmm. right? Talk without action is trust washing. <laughs> that's good. good one. <laughs> I'm glad you like it. It's a, it's a new headline in my new report. <laughs> um, and so you do, it really is about how you show up. You know, and I, I also have to say I was very struck by the emphasis that Doug put on, you know, this notion that you have to declare yourself, right? That's very different from saying you have to explain yourself, mm -hmm. right, or introduce yourself. And what it, because what it means to me is that you declare what you stand for, right, and everything that goes with that, your values, you know, because those are the things that tell me, you know, whether, whether I can trust you to do the right thing. Right, because that's going to be based on the shared values. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Um, Andrea, this goes to you. And I'd love to understand, when you look at Eli Lilly, does trust show up differently by geography, by department, by country? And if so, what does that look like? It, yeah, it does, <laughs> definitely. Um, it's probably slightly easier to, if you have a, a good trustworthy leader in a smaller environment, say affiliate, that's probably slightly easier because there are less layers. Um, in the um, big corporate, the headquarters um, and you know, with all the layers also we are everywhere around the world, um, it's, it is more difficult. And this is why, why I think about um, what, what I was asking, Doug. Uh, there is, I think I have, I have a huge trust in the top management because I, and, and now with my new role uh, in the, uh, as a chairperson, you know, I, I get into contact with them directly and I can say they are committed, right? But in between, there are people who maybe didn't grasp everything properly yet. So, yeah. And I think, and, and you know, what I see as my role is now that I, I can, um, I have access to top management, I try to feed them with what's wrong still. And, and so thinking about, because you, you've been there for a long time. Right. You have an established brand. Right. You're, you're in a position of power and influence because of your role. Right. How would employees at the lower levels of the organization in different countries around the world say? I mean, how would yeah. they, what would they say? 
Yeah, and, and I can, if I'm perfectly honest, which I try to be, I think sometimes they can't. I, I think we should be clear, but I mean, I, I don't want us to fool ourselves. And even when uh, Lily, um, you know, Lily is uh, uh, among the leaders uh, for, um, you know, how we go about people with disabilities and also our self-ID, but still there's, there's so much to do. So. Um, I think our ERG, I mean all our ERGs, but talking now about our working and living with disabilities ERG, that's what we try to do. We try to have representatives everywhere. And um, this is where we, we try to uh, um, encourage people who um, don't feel they have power to talk to us. It's always completely anonymous. There is, you know, it's just um, person to person, right? And then we can also, you know, give them, uh, encourage them, give them advice. You know, we would uh, normally, if it's something uh, that needs to come to attention of HR, we would encourage them to do them, explain how and so on. But also just give them examples where it worked, you know, because sometimes people just are too scared, but actually, we have things in place where, you know, they should be okay. So uh, I loved that you said that you have great trust in management. Mm -hmm. And Tonya, one of the data points from your presentation and the survey is that there's a huge gap between management and um, between, yeah, there's a gap between management always tells the truth and the trust. Yes. How do you reconcile that? How, how do you close that? Crazy. I mean, what, what have they said? Do you think management lies? I mean, why would people think there's such a shortfall in that expectation, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I was really shocked when I saw that data point. And I, you know, as we talked to various people about it and, and, and got some input and looked at some case studies and some additional data, I mean, I think in the end, it's the, the, the problem is that most of us as managers are not comfortable with uncertainty and not having the answers, right? And so when we don't have the answers, what do we do? We don't talk, mm -hmm. or we no comment, or we, you know, go and do some research and try to come up with the answers, but we're not out there humbly saying, I, I don't know. Can you help me figure it out? Mm -hmm. You know, want to be part of coming up with a solution. Um, and so I think that maybe that reticence around admitting that you don't have all the answers and information often translates into you're not giving me the whole story. You're not telling me what's going on, right? Because you're not telling me that you don't know the answer. You know, and maybe that's the truth that they're not hearing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so practically, Doug, coming to you now, there was low trust or lack of trust between the time, you know, where you were before you went on this journey of building trust across the, the organization. So how did you, what was the journey that you had to go on in building trust with employees in the middle all the way down to that security person or the person who cleans the washroom? Well, the, uh, uh, I love, I love Tanya's uh, definition of trust and the parameters of it. I think of it in a similar way. I, I think there are three things. To, to be, you have to sort of have a vision of what, what you're talking about when you talk about trust. And I think there's an important communication element in terms of declaring yourself. And, and then you have to be competent to deliver against that. So competence is important. And I think I'm going to unpack competence is IQ. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to be able to process information. You got to be like a PhD molecular <laughs> mumbo jumbo person. You've got to be uh, so it's IQ, it's EQ. You got to be emotionally competent, and it, I call it FQ, which is you have to be functionally competent in the area you're responsible for, whatever whatever area that is. So you've got, and then you have to do what you say you're going to do. You have to have high character. So it's declaring yourself, being competent displaying character and consistently doing it over and over and over again. Uh, and so that I'm oversimplifying, but that's basically what I did when I got there. We declared our commitment to our employees. We said we're going to work with you to figure out how we're going to bring that to life here. And then we were very transparent and shared and 
we committed to a long journey with them. We did not ever overpromise and underdeliver, though. Mm -hmm. uh, there's tendency in the corporate world to make to promise something, and it goes well in the presentation, and then you actually have to go do it. So, uh, uh, so th that was my solution. There's one thing about the middle that there's something each of you can do, and. Uh, I call it uh, sk over uh, skip level uh, reviews, and that's where uh, all of my leaders were expected to manage their group, of course. But then I expected that I have an in-depth connection with each one of the direct reports of their direct reports. Yeah. They'd go through a review process. Their manager would give them feedback, and then they would have another meeting mm -hmm. with the leader the manager and that employee uh, for a half hour to an hour to be really clear about what the expectations were. So, and it went, cascaded all the way down. So every manager was held accountable for two layers, not one. Yeah. And in the fullness of time, I think that breaks down mm -hmm. that frozen middle. So that's just a practical thing. Yeah, it's extremely helpful. Um, Andre, I want to go back to you, and I'd love for you to talk about what were some of the critical barriers from the employee's point of view to self-ID disclosure? And how did you handle that? I think um, what Doug said about being anchoring, you know, like knowing truly who you are is really, I, I mean, uh, there, is, there is no greater resource, I think, because to me, I, I, I just, when Doug talked about it, I just remembered the situation when people said like, on, oh, you should never, ever disclose this. And I thought, uh, you know, after you know, thinking about it for a long time and um, considering all uh, pros and cons, I thought if I am going to be fired because I have a mental <laughs> disability, then I don't want to work for this company, right? And this is, I think, that gives you that strength mm -hmm. and, you know, um, permission to be so vulnerable. And I want to also, because we talk so much about, you know, trust, vulnerability, and so on, I, I really, and I think I experience this now uh, daily, the greatest vulnerability is the greatest power. I, I tell people, like, there is nothing that somebody can tell me about me, nothing worse than I already know about myself, right? So if you, uh, I mean, I, I so agree with, like, and also um, um, just admitting your mistakes, right? It also gives, um, that builds trust, I think, also in, in the ways that people don't feel they hide to their mistakes, right? Yeah. So if you say like, oh yeah, that, that was wrong, mm -hmm. we'll try to do something about it and move on. And then people, hopefully, and you know, I, I feel this is happening when you truly do it, um, people come with their mistakes because they know it's permitted. I love what you just said about vulnerability and power and trust because it's almost the same thing that Doug said earlier, mm -hmm. that vulnerability you know, is connected to and it, it builds trust, mm -hmm. which gives you power. Right. right? Yeah. And, you know, read Brene Brown. You've all, you all know her, you've all read her, watch her TED Talks. It's, uh, she's a tough talking Texan, but she's tough because she showcases her vulnerability and uh, not a better role model. And well, there's a pretty good one right here. <laughs> Thank you. Let me turn to the audience. Um, I have lots of questions more for them. Uh, and we have a hand over there. So just raise your hand and a microphone will come over to you or someone will bring a microphone to you. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. If you could stand. Uh, you yeah, sure. Know? Um, yeah, uh, one question I had for uh, may, uh, may, uh, many of us who have a invisible disability, we've you know gone through our whole lives thinking that it's a big weakness, that there's stereotypes, stigmas. Um, so how do we help those people who, I mean, they might not even want to identify with that employee re resource group, group, uh, group, uh, group, group, uh, group uh, Group, group at, at all, at, at, at all either, because they just are just so uh, far removed from the idea of one associate with, with this disability. How how do we help those employees to 
be able to come out and identify and and, and get this acceptance and um, you, you know em- embrace this vulnerability aspect you mentioned when you know they've gone their whole lives thinking uh, uh, very very differently and genuinely believing that the organization uh, from the top to down the managers think the same way. Mm-hmm. Who would like to take that? I'll try. I'll try. I have a point of view on everything. So, <laughs> uh, but you know, we've dealt with this in diversity and inclusion in lots of places. The LGBT community was trying to find their way into the mainstream. Very hard to self-identify, right? Uh, I think we have to create a culture that celebrates everyone mm-hmm. and that that respects everyone. That we have to honor the agenda of every individual if we ever hope those individuals as a community to honor our agenda. And so what I tried to do in the organizations I was part of, where I had influence, I tried to honor everybody. And and some people, it was more visible than other people. And I think if you can find a way to influence your world with honor, all the people that you're associated with, I have found even when I was managing a group of three people, we all of a sudden had more power, and we started influencing the people around us. Uh, I, to me, it's, uh, there's no easy answer to this, but I, I do think if you, you can create a culture where people feel honored, and in the fullness of time, uh, we created, we had no affinity groups when I, or now they're ERG groups, I'm old, mm-hmm. but uh, uh, we had no affinity groups at Campbell. Today, we have over 5,000 people in the women of Campbell. We have a vibrant LGBT group. We have an African American group, an Hispanic American group. We have a, a the millennials wanted to form their own. They said, "Well, you're leaving us out. We want our own group." And I said, "Fine, have your own group." And the interesting thing about the millennials was, after they thought about it, they came back and said, "Well, we don't want our own." Uh, you called our bluff. <laughs> they said, what we want is we want a multi-generational group, mm. which was brilliant. And we, they said, we want all six generations talking with each other. Mm. We want to have our own ERG group, multi-generational. And, I, it was, and we would never have thought of it. But we started to create a culture where we were celebrating people. And in the fullness of time, people rose up. I, I can share from a practical standpoint, I've had almost 20 years, well, 20 years of diversity and inclusion leadership roles across multiple global organizations. And so there are multiple ways that you can address it. Um, one is working with your HR function to ensure policies are in place um, that gives permission. It's one way of giving right. permission. Uh, but I also developed a program for um, the last firm I worked for, and it was called Role Models Program, and it's very powerful, and it's exactly what Andrea has done, which is you know, storytelling. And what we did, we identify role models across the firm globally who would share their stories. And these individuals were carefully selected, by the way, um, and we focused on specific dimensions of diversity that we wanted to highlight, particularly the dimensions that are invisible. And so we had these people who are in leadership roles and people who are just in ordinary roles, all the way down to people who cleaned the bathroom floor. We had them tell their stories. And it has been a remarkable success because we've looked at these individuals and you know, we make assumptions about them, not knowing things that are invisible about them. So there's, again, a two-pronged approach that you can take. And these are just two practical examples of how I have led it across firms. Um, and how you know, they've been successful. But these two things give people permission. But it does take courage for someone to come forward. And you know, maybe you have to be the first one if you haven't done so yet. Uh, Andre, you yeah, had I just wanted to add, and uh, we do, of course, uh, something similar, like we have panels where people share. But um, even like step before, if you feel uh, in your organization you um, are not that far yet, is uh, what we do is educating people about the disabilities of famous people. 
and we also take care to you know always have like really serious uh, it's not uh, something you just download from internet there's uh, like scientific studies about Mozart uh, being uh, bipolar or borderline Lincoln having dep severe depression um, Beethoven being um, deaf right um, and by the way uh, Da Vinci uh, potentially having ADHD yeah. So um, if you, and, and, but it's important to have serious source, right? Because otherwise people can think you are inventing things. So that's, that's also something where nobody is like, um, you know, you, you don't harm anybody, right? You, you just share and educate people. The other thing too to think about, um, starting perhaps with something that we, that, it, that is easier to talk about. Um, I was reading on the flight last night, um, a piece about, um, sleep and how poor sleep and sleep deprivation affect the mind and can lead to mental health issues. And there is a lot of research behind that. So a lot of us work in companies and perhaps all of us in this room have suffered from sleep deprivation that have impacted our minds. And it, it may not be, or it may not, you know, have gone as far as mental health issues, but there's a direct correlation to that. So maybe starting with something that all of us experience in some way, shape, or form, using research to back up that point, um, and engaging again in dialogue. So there are multiple ways that um, this can be addressed. Is that helpful to you? All right. Um, other questions? We've got one over here. I come at this work, um, the, the disability field, um, from the, an education perspective. And I was also one of those kids who was never identified as having a really significant learning disability and auditory processing disorder in school and was told, oh, she's so bright, she's just not working up to her potential. <laughs> and oh. in this definition and discussion about trust, I keep going back in my mind to sort of a hierarchy of needs and are we getting at some level of affirming safety for people to establish trust? And I think my question, Tonya, is for you is which comes first, trust or safety? And does the barometer get at any of those very minute details? Oh my gosh, that's a, 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 so we don't, we don't look at trust in a psychological way, in that way, um, but I can tell you that just sort of from a broader macro trend perspective, right, the, the consequences of people losing trust in the institutions that at their most basic function are supposed to protect us, right, from harm, against harm, and keep us safe. Right, and, and that can play out in all kinds of ways, very extreme ways, but you know, even things such as regulation, you know, against and, and everything that's happening, for instance, Doug and I were talking earlier about, you know, the information torrent of, you know, fake news and misinformation that we're exposed to and that we're not being protected from in whatever whatever however that's supposed to look, right? Um, so absolutely, that is one of the most basic things and the consequences of not having the trust that institutions will protect me um, are, are pretty severe, and we're seeing it play out in the world in all kinds of ways, right? People are turning to, you know, looking for help from business, looking for help from their employer, from brands, um, but they're also, you know, looking to each other. They're looking for answers from strong leaders. They believe that the whole system is beyond salvation in some cases, right? And we'd rather just blow it up at, at any cost. Uh, than, than trust the system that is so clearly corrupt and not looking out for us. Uh, so I do think that, that, yeah, if you don't feel safe, <laughs> it's hard to do much after that um, if you don't have that most essential thing. I don't know, what do you you know, the employee engagement work, all the employee engagement work drives off Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And at the base is safety, mm -hmm. physical safety right. and emotional safety. And uh, so the engagement work in a nuanced way can give you insights into are we improving the sense of safety among our population. But what I've seen is it, it just takes a long time. 
So, and, you know, it's, it's, it's very ponderous, and we're in a right here, right now age, right? And you just got to get better, faster, and, uh, and it's, it's a ponderous process. But all the engagement survey work, if you, it, I don't care who provides it, it basically drives off Maslow's hierarchy of needs and at the base is safety. And it's worth peeling the onion back on that if you do any work in that space. We have time for one more question. Okay, we've got two hands, so we'll take both questions. We'll two short two questions. Two very short questions. We'll get very quick answers. Hi. Um, thank you for the great information. I actually have a 12-year-old son who's been diagnosed with ADHD. And so I'm thinking about what I can do to help him over the next 10 years to prepare him for the conversations that will be had in terms of the interview process, um, there's some things you can and should disclose, other things that I'm wondering whether you should or not in that process of getting them into a great employer who understands the issues and has the, the, the groups that Doug has talked about. But how do we maneuver past and not, not so much through the schooling process because there's a lot of programs already in place to help him through that. But once he's out, he's 22, 23 years old, looking for work, looking for that great employer who can be very supportive. How, how do you maneuver someone like that through that process so that he's not looked differently, because he's intelligent, he's a bright kid, he's my son. But, um, <laughs> but um, so, so he your can wife's get- wife's son. Yeah, that's, <laughs> see, that's why Let's you're smart, clear. Doug. That's why you're smart. Um, but I'd like to get your thoughts on, on, on that, because uh, that'll, uh, that'll help me to maneuver over the next uh, decade or so with him. Thank you. Shall, shall I take this one? Yes. So I, and I realized um, um, just after I went off the stage for the, uh, the first time, I did not answer uh, one uh, item that I, I promised to answer, and that was like what my job is right now and why it's good for me. Um, and this, is, this can be part to, uh, of uh, answer to your question. Um, so I work, I prepare people for FDA inspections, right? And um, this is absolutely perfect fit for me because when everybody, this is typical, I, I'm expecting this audience to know a little bit about ADHD, uh, so I won't explain a lot of the background, but when everybody is in panic, I am at my best. I am hyper-focused, I am uh, like, I can go on forever, I can give directions, so... I'm thinking that one of the really important things, you, you were asking how to get to that great employer. But I think start with him focusing on what he can do really well instead of chasing what, you know, like rut boring routine work, which we are not great at. So um, looking to develop more what he is good at and what he's unique in. Because that, I think, also gives you confidence to represent yourself, right? With all your, you know, flaws and, and yeah. So I, I think that would be my top advice. You know, go be yourself at your utmost. That's a great. I have a 34-year-old ADHD son, <laughs> so you're going to have a wonderful ride. <laughs> but, uh, that's great advice. I wish I had known you when he was 12. But that, in, in our experience, channeling into what he did really well and helping him do that and pursue that dream is really, I find, it's the only way. And we're just hitting stride at the age of 34. You've got a better shot. One last question coming up. Okay. We, we sure we have time? I mean, if they... We've got one in the front here. She, she has had her hand up. Go, go ahead with the microphone. Oh, um, I, I mean, if you have time, you have time. But uh, no, so my question is, I, you know, we're, we're very passionate about, you know, getting these people in, making sure that they disclose. But then once, once they're in, uh, question for all three, maybe four of you, but um, how can we build trust and be patient that, that person who disclosed and that we put in is actually going to be successful in that job and in that role. Because sometimes I feel like that might not have been communicated, okay, HR knows person A has a disability, but then the manager of that project or the, or the person overlooking it might, 
might have not had that broadcasted or maybe has a different agenda, different mindset where there's a tight deadline and people have to get Project B done. So because of that, you know, since maybe things are a little slower, we not, might not trust him as much, but, you know, he might be good at building relationships or, you know, good at something else. So how do we build that trust in or make sure that we have the right resources to make that person successful either in that job, in that role, once they enter the workforce or once they enter that job after disclosing? So we'll get one of you to answer that. There, you, you go. I, um, I, I don't know that I have the expertise, but I kind of want to say there's never a guarantee that somebody's going to be successful, right? It, a little bit, you have to give them the room to do the job, right? But I also imagine that there are policies from an HR perspective that also could probably be followed to help make sure that that person is surrounded with the right leadership and tools that they need to be successful and you know, address whatever disabilities they might have. Mm -hmm. Okay, how'd I do? Let's squeeze in this question Hi. here. I'm short, I'm not much taller when I stand up. So <laughs> I wanna thank you all for today. It's been really a mind-opening experience on trust. Um, I have a question, I was thinking about what I do with media and people with disabilities and making sure there's more of alignment and authentic representation so they see themselves on large, small, and personal screens. What's the role of discovery in the sense of trust? So for an employer to, to push away those stereotypes of people with disabilities and lowered expectations, to find within your employee and discover their authentic mm -hmm. self and their skills and like using your disability to sharpen their competitive edge. And conversely, for the employee who may not see themselves. I mean, Ali Stroker at the Tonys did a great acceptance speech, and so we have more role models, to your point. But what's, this, what's the role of discovery and allowing an old set of myths to make ground for new understanding that would build more of an authentic foundation trust? I was on a red eye, so I don't know if that makes sense, but it's something I'm thinking about today. We'll have one short, quick answer. Talk, you have an opinion on this. <laughs> you did say you have an opinion on everything. I do have an opinion on everything. There's no easy answer. We just have to, I, you know, my wife used to work a thousand years ago on uh, the Navajo Indian Reservation. And, uh, uh, and she had, they had this feeling about time. Well, things take the time they take. And uh, she'd say, well, when should we meet? And they'd say, well, when we get there. <laughs> and it'll take, it, we'll get there when we get there, and then we'll meet. And, uh, and I just have a feeling this is, a, this is, we have to soldier through this with good intentions and, uh, and consistently better behavior. I, 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 I wish there was, I just don't think there's an easy answer to this. If there was, we would have done it already, right? May I, is, may I add one thing to that? Yeah, which please. Is that I, add two. I, be, I believe, um, uh, I, and I have seen, I've experienced, right, in various roles, that when you design a solution for the exception, right, when you work hard to solve a problem mm -hmm. that is affecting one in, individual, you make everybody's life better, mm -hmm. right? Because That's you create a new yeah. sense of awareness, empowerment, whatever it is, right, that you you're saying, hey, here's what we're going to do to help this person. Mm -hmm. Everybody gets help. Absolutely. So I think it is hard work, but it's very worthwhile. We'll take one final quick question. <laughs> oh, from Crystal <laughs> Emery. One final quick question. Oh, yeah. Hi. Um, there's two things I want to share as an employer, um, and then as a parent. As an employer, when I am working with a differently abled person, and I look at our policy, at our personnel uh, handbook, I discovered that I have to take more time with that person. And that <laughs> repetition, is very, very helpful in onboarding someone. Mm -hmm. It helps with the trust factor. 
because they see that you are taking out additional time to assist them. But one of the things I learned is that in that onboarding, you have to throw in, you have to force a change curve. Meaning, as you are onboarding them, you are actually creating little chaotic situations so that you can see how they're going to respond and help them respond to it. And I work in production, so, you know, we know the week before production, things are just crazy as hell. I have a woman that works with us that cannot handle um, that type of pressure, but she's brilliant. And so what we do is we make sure that she is not in the middle of the mix, but we also prepared her so that now she has tools that she's been working on, tools as an organization that we've been working with her, so that that big change or that big whatever happens, she's a little more prepared for it. And a lot of times we don't onboard in that way. We say, well, this is your job, this is what you do, and we repeat it, but we don't throw into that mix what chaos may look like. And if you help them at the start of that, it really goes far. To the man who said, what do you do about your children when they go out into the world? My brother is autistic. And, and I never know exactly what the hell he knows and doesn't know. <laughs> Some days he's like so brilliant, we go, wow. And other days he's like, oh, I don't want to do it. What we have done, because he has a job, right, is to really apply what I just said and throw in those situations that are challenging. He happens to like blondes with bangs, okay? You can't go in a work environment, can touch a woman's bangs and think that it's okay. And so we create situations where we know that he has a deficit and that we can assist him in either controlling it or working through it, or um, when things drop, big, loud noises frighten him, or burns frighten him, right? And so we've had to walk, work through that so that when he is not with us, he, now birds still frighten him, but he no longer lays down on the ground and covers his head. He will sigh to somebody, those are birds, I'm afraid. But there are ways if you don't cuddle them so much and introduce those experiences before they happen. And as an employer, you know the things that go on in your office that make you crazy. So, you know, they're just going to stress somebody else. But those are tools that I have learned to utilize and it just makes it a lot easier for my team as well as for the individual. I couldn't find and I cannot find a more perfect way to end this session because the practical wisdom and encouragement from her is exactly what I hope all of you are here for. You've been sitting here for several hours I would love for you to stand on your feet and give our panel members a great big round of applause and stand if you can. <laughs> <Namaste>. <laughs>